So thank you, Nicholas. Um, I'm, I'm a bit in awe of the group, actually, and I'm sure there's lots of experience in the group, and I'm hoping that we can actually learn from each other and, and bounce a few ideas around. So this is not just a one-way exercise, this is a two-way exercise, I'm hoping, um, and to make it work. So what Nicholas didn't mention is that they suddenly came and um, all heck broke loose and we had sales flapping and it was just a complete disaster. And very nice of you to ignore that part of the story, but all the rest of it was good. So, um, so now, we're, now we're that in, in place and now we're talking about forecasting. We'll look at the accuracy of the forecasting or not, as the case may be, and, um, and what we're doing about it. So, um, forecast, actual uh, forecasts. Whether I treat in three ways. I treat it as what we're expecting to get, what we actually get, and then what do we need to do about it? Why, why do we care and what's going on? And this is our old favourite, uh, sea breeze. Has that got a bit of a hum to it? Do we need to turn it down a bit so it's not quite so clicky for you? Is that okay? Yeah. Is okay? Yeah. Okay. Okay. So this is our old favourite sea breeze. It's been around for a long, long time. I started using it about 30, 40 years ago, and it was the best thing since sliced bread at the time. Um, but it is showing its age now, and for forecast, I don't use it anymore. But who's used seaweeds, everyone? A few people. So, just in case you're not aware of it, uh, the colour scheme on seaweeds is the, that's the default colour scheme, you can change it. But it was written by windsurfers in Perth. And in the windsurfing model with the uh, Fremantle Doctor, it works apparently quite well, but over the years, it's sort of like not as good as what we might be able to do. So red here is as a windsurfer, don't bother getting out of bed, just keep on going. Yellow is marginal, maybe get a coffee, you know, get something and wander down and maybe do some windsurfing. Green is like leap out and go. The wind is on, now is your time to sail. And there's another one up above that, which is brown, and you can guess why that, that might be the colour of the <laughs> so, um, that's, uh, we do come back to sea breeze, but uh, not for the forecast. So this is our official forecast, so we've got one uh, official forecast, and um, and Medi, which is which is uh, demonstrated over there. Medi, you can zoom in and out. It's a fantastic resource, but I don't use it um, because there's some other stuff that I find easier to use. It is, however, our official thing, and we need to go to it uh, occasionally. Sea temperature. That's our one in the middle there. Um, which is really cool actually. It shows our East Australian current coming down there with that lovely purple. And this was taken a couple of days ago, so it's like, yep, that's the current we want to go into if we're southbound. And if we're northbound, maybe not so much. But it's like, it's, it, you know, it does loops and it does curls. And if you're going to Lord Howe, this would be a really good thing to go, well, yep, let's try and, well, maybe not go down Lola Bell and go to Lord Howe, but maybe we want to get into it at one stage and we'll be doing some planning around. Where, uh, where the bottom really falls down is that they are a, re a bit stuck in the art with this stuff. So this is something that used to be read out in days gone by on VHF or other things, and, and you can get it as a text, and, um, and it's very low data. It's very data friendly. But if I said to you, this is the area affected, the 44 cells, the 87 east by 43 cells, 108 east, and it goes on, there's like about six of them here, it actually bounds the area, and of course you know what I'm talking about when I say that. So, uh, again, I, I tend not to use that, uh, that stuff. So what do I use for forecasts? This is one of my favourites, really weather. This is a specific location. So if you're at a particular anchorage, thank you. If you're at a particular anchorage or uh, you want to know what's happening, this is really easy to look at. Graphical, it gives you a wind strength, it gives you a wind direction. You can click on the rainfall tab up here instead of the wind tab, rainfall tab. I don't normally look at weather, but it's probably a good thing to know what temperature it is and how much clothes you need to be wearing at the time. And then sun and moon and, and other stuff. Um, really simple, love it, my go to. The interesting thing here also is that you've got your one day, three day, five day type forecast. And off you go, and um, yep, you, you know that in five days' time, that's what you're going to get. Except that it's never works like that. Is it a different model? Is it a different model, underlying model to like sea breeze? Correct. Is it? Okay. it is, and it's different to model. So, so all of these, not all of them, this one, but the previous one, 
this bases itself off bomb modeling, but not entirely. So it uses other sources as well. The, the thing about bully weather is it's quite specific. You can put in here, Middle Harbour, and it'll be different to Pitwater, it'll be different to Botany Bay, it'll be different to other areas. So it's quite a specific area of rain. Um, and they do draw from other stuff, so bomb and other things. But it's just easy to read and, and graphically what's going on. This is my go-to. Um, this is called windy.com. And the really nice thing about windy, if I'm capable of doing this, and I don't know that I am, but let's give it a shot. Um, if I can make it work. Oh, that's why that's not working. Why didn't I set this up before and bear with me while I set up the hotspot? Because I should have done that before. That would have been a hard And a little luck. So we've got, um, so that's our, that's our sea breeze that we were looking at just there a moment ago. And I don't use actual, oh, it's not happening up there. How do I get out of there? Bear with me. How do I escape out of this? Escaping? Something like that? Yes? Very good. And then, how long? Is that happening? Ah, very good. Okay, so that's our, um, that's our, uh, our willy weather, and I don't use the actuals here. For me, at Pitwater, that comes out of Terry Hills, but I find that Terry Hills has got a tree on one side of it, that where, wherever it's measuring. So from three directions, it works fine. Fourth direction, it's absolutely hopeless. Um, so I don't use the, the actuals, but I do use the forecast, as I mentioned. And then Windy is the, um, is the really cool one. So Windy, I absolutely love. And it's because there's all sorts of stuff hidden in here. You can see very quickly, this is more windy than that bit, and what direction and what's happening. You can say, if I'm here, you can see why it might be a northeasterly, it might be an easterly, or if you move down a bit further, it might be a, you know, a, a southeasterly or other things. So you can see graphically very easily what's going on. And of course, you can zoom into that, and um, and it starts getting uh, starts getting better. You can even ping a spot, and then it comes up with this tabley thing down the bottom of uh, wind strengths and directions and colours to help you and, and all that sort of stuff. If we just get out of that and go back, if you're the sort of person that likes isobars, we can uh, we can turn them on. And then I'll just zoom out a little bit. And then it becomes more obvious that we've got you know, a high system here, and that's the wind direction going around the high, and we've got lows or, or pressure gradients and, and other stuff. On our edge over here, we've got, we're looking at wind, but we can turn it into gusts, we can turn it into thunderstorms, rain, that sort of, again, all forecasts. Uh, clouds, waves, waves in multiple directions, depending on the depth that you go to. And down at the bottom here, we've got our timeline. So at the moment, we're looking at uh, Monday at 5 o'clock. Um, we can just look at tomorrow and go, well, that's what's happening tomorrow. And you can actually play it and run through it and play it like a little video thing as well. Yes? Is the temperature water temp or air? No, it's an air temperature thing. Yeah. No, there's no water that I've found. Having, having said that, Windy is changing almost by the week, certainly by the month, there's more stuff just going in and in all the time. Um, the isobars, for instance, weren't there a month ago that I found. Um, so it was just when I was playing the other day and I went, oh, this, this is cool. It uh, shows you more stuff. Yes? Yeah, just to answer Dallas's question, there are, yeah. within that app, the currents and the temperatures of all the water flows and so if you can see it, you say from here to you may. Yeah. It's in there. So it's in there? Yeah, absolutely. Excellent. Well, there you go. In the more layers. In the more layers. Let's have a look. Let's have a look. Um, and see more layers. Um, you can see. Even thunderstorms. Any, anyone yeah. that you fly as well, you can get we can a different. Do, we can do rain and thunder. Doubting what you're saying because it's 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 a case of wandering. Oh, sea temperature. There you go. 
Seat temperature is there. There we go. Nice. Whoa, look at that. That's pretty. No wonder we're going to get a it's pretty. It's so there you go. Thank you, Thank you very much. <laughs> this is what I was hoping to come on home. Yes. No, no that, that's an app. That's not an app. That that is actually just a website. That's a straight website that, that I'm using there. So it's not. You can. A lot of these products have an app version and they have a website version, like a www type version. I tend not to use the apps because they tend to be behind the features as they're putting into the website. But it's up to you as to what you find convenient and what's going on. But that's just a that's just a web browser. So you just put in windy.com and off you go. Um, there, yeah. Where the ice uh, There's a little button down here. Button down here is pressure. Pressure button. Yeah. Yeah. Um, the other thing that I will draw your attention to is this little panel here, which is the ECMWF GFS access and icon, which in your which are let's just go back to how do I turn that one off now? Let's undo that one. Except the top. Except the top? No, that just closes all the thing down. I think I've got to turn wind back on. Is it wind? X? No, that's not it. Wind, wind, wind. There we go, wind's back. So down in these, these are the different, these are five different models. Four different models at the moment. Um, so you can look at what other models are predicting or not. And as the time goes closer, typically the models align. So if I look at in three hours' time, they're likely to be exactly the same. But if I'm looking at one day ahead or two days ahead or three days ahead, progressively they get more and more diverse. So what that means is that if I, for instance, roll up, let's have a look at Friday in the icon one, it's likely just sort of have that picture in your head. It's likely to be, well, that's similar. Uh, no, GFS doesn't be great. And um, so we've got three that are predicting that yeah. Yeah. something like, and one that's, that's not as strong a win. So you can look at the four models, and if you want to, a dive, deep diver and just keep diving in. There's also, I think, in Windy, you can, because I've not got the premium version, it's not the version. Go premium thing as well, and you can look at it if you are flying a plane for different heights of the whole thing at different heights. So you can decide what height you want to go to for what wind conditions you want. It's it's it just keeps getting it just keeps getting more. And, uh, and I went, oh my god, this is just going to change the way that we look at the weather, and it, and it has. And then. It's been taken up commercially and, um, and it's just getting, as I said, it's just getting better and better and better all the time. The, uh, the only downside is that you can get just completely lost and, um, uh, and distracted on what you're doing. So, um, so you can dive into this forever and never come to a conclusion, which is why I come back to Willie Weather for a location going, just keep things simple for me, please. <laughs> So, uh, so that's Wendy. Um, I, I really recommend you spend some time in, uh, in Wendy. So Wendy, more or less, not the app though, but the actual website. Yeah. The website. Yep. Yep. So, so forecasts. What are we looking at? You've got to go to the official one. You've got to look at Medi or at least be aware of what's going on. Uh, Willy Weather, for instance, brings up the warnings. So when you're in a location for warnings for Willy Weather, it actually says. These are the warnings that apply to your area, rather than be giving a, a lap long type thing. So if you trust it, that's great. If you don't, use other methods and go to the source, which is uh, which is wrong. Um, so spot weather, really weather, just because it's simple. Area, I like to look at windy. If and, uh, and, and one of the things is, for instance, you look at really weather and you go, oh, it's a pleasant little ten knots of wind happening out there, and then you look at windy. And there's 10 knots here, but you only go two kilometres off the coast and it's 40, and it's like, oh, I'm 
okay, so I don't need to move very much or the weather system to move very much and I'm in a very different wind condition. Mm. So, so I like looking at windy just as a concept of space of what's happening here but uh, what's happening elsewhere. Predict wind, predict wind's been around quite a long time. It's, uh, it's got a, comp they've got two products. They've got a free version and a paid version. Uh, and the paid version includes all sorts of different models. I spoke to the guy who's in New Zealand that developed um, Predict Wind some years ago, and it's, it's hundreds of thousands of dollars that he pays for access to some of the models, the wind models and wind prediction systems. Um, and part of that is, uh, is, you know, you pay for the service. And they also have a routing service, Predict Wind have a routing service, so you can put in, I want to go from here to here, these are the polars, these are the speeds that I do, um, where's the best way to go with the wind, and they'll say go down here, and then go up there, and then go across here. Um, Windy under the premium service also has a routing thing happening, um, and again, it's, it's under development, uh, like all these things. VHF, VHF unfortunately has gone away of the dodo. Um, you don't, uh, I don't listen to VHF weather forecasts anymore, but I do always go to the channel and tune in on them to see if there's any local warnings. So if, because they'll often, Marine Rescue, when they're doing the weather warnings, they'll often tag on a, this thing has moved or that's broken or something else has happened. Uh, up at uh, White Bay Bar a few years ago, the sandbar was moving faster than what they could change the leads, and they said, don't use the leads. Like, the, the, the sandbar is approximately at this location, um, and that was on VHF. So that was a, an easy way of getting up-to-date information for, for what's happening. But for weather, um, not so much. I, I find it extraordinary that Bomb can word a 10 to 15 knot nor'easter coming in later in the afternoon, there's about 20 different ways you can put that phrase. Um, and I've never really worked out which one's which and what have worked, so I basically ignore it. Then we get to actual weather. So, so what are we, how do we, from an electronic perspective, um, what's going on? And this is where we come to sea breeze again. So if we stroll down past the forecast and roll down a bit further, the really nice thing about sea breeze that we can, Here's another one for actual weather. 
that my absolutely go-to is bomb radar. So here we've got our normal storm rain radar thingy, and um, and we've got our density of rain happening down here. So I refer to black rain, it's like heavy rain. So when I'm casually talking, I'm going, that's the black rain coming this way. Like, oh, it's, it's referring to this. And the reason that that's important is because if you're, actually no, I won't do that, I'll talk about that in a minute. Um, one of the things about uh, our bomb radar is that it's got this and we've been using that for ages and that's great. But if you go on to, look, it's not on the app, fantastic, thanks Tom. But if you go on the website and you go to the far right hand corner, right, like 512, there's an old one there and it says Doppler Wind. And Doppler Wind is really cool. Doppler Wind will give you this. And, and Double Wind is pretty magic. It's, uh, they've been slowly rolling it out into the different radar systems up and down the east, east coast or around Australia. It's now almost all of them, um, as we speak, not quite, but nearly. There's a few out of the country that don't have Double Wind, and the farmers are going, please, please, we actually want Double Wind. It's an expensive exercise. It's measuring the speed of dust particles, so it gives you a clue as to like over a 128k range measuring dust particles, it's like, okay, that's pretty high tech. Um, and you've got to be, use it a bit fuzzy, it's not perfectly accurate. So roughly what it's trying to tell you is, um, is blue is towards the radar and, uh, and the other colours are away. Now it's actually quite hard to see here, but there's a sort of a white line there. So we're going, in this area here, it's going blue that way, across the white line and then into yellow or, or orange type stuff. Often what you'll find a typical normal day, there's just a little patch of colour here and everything else is black. Which is fine. That means that everything's normal and we're all good. But if you start to see darker colours, so this colour here is lining up with this stuff here. So what it's telling you is that there's actually wind coming out of that rain storm. That's a, that's a squall happening um, that's coming out of this rain. And I'll talk more about that in a minute. What, what, what was that button called? That you, on the top Doppler of wind. Sorry. Doppler. D-O, it's this Doppler. Doppler wind, D-O-double-P-L-E-R. It's right up in the top right hand corner. It's, it's sound, it's, yeah. It's like a train whistle where the train's coming towards you and goes yeah. and then it goes past and goes Did that sound right? Anyway, <laughs> one way or the other. Um, it's like a train. That's the, that's the Doppler effect. Um, what this, what the Doppler does for us though, for the first time in East Coast or around here, is it gives us easy vision to the west. And when you see something like this one, and we're now talking, these colours here are like 60, 70 kilometres an hour type stuff. When we see this sort of thing turn up on a dock of wind, don't go sailing. Like this is stay at home, stay in bed type Wait, stuff. Can you explain what, what are we seeing now? We're seeing we're seeing the wind towards the radar, which is here, which is yeah. blues, this way, and we're seeing orange away from the radar, and the colour is the speed. So we're looking at 60, 70, even maybe 80 kilometres an hour wind happening over there at Warragamba Dam. Now this is a western. And the radar station is in Terry Hills, there, right? So that's in the centre of is, that. Terry Hills is the goal. Yeah. Terry Hills is where the, where the thing is, yeah. Um, so we're a bit further here, we're a bit further down, we're down in Moscow's and Sydney area, that sort of space. But, but what this is trying, but the way that I read this, is that in a westerly, the, the wind pushes up against the mountains, so that's what we call pressure, or you know, gusts and all that sort of stuff, called pressure. It pushes up against the mountains, and just like a liquid, it will go over the mountains and it will roll down the other side, just as if it was a river. So imagine water being pushed up against a blockage and then it gets it overtops it and just screams down the other side. That's what's happening here. Which is which is why in in Sydney, our most and East Coast, our most deadly wind is a westerly. It's a clear sky, no clouds, no indication. And a very pleasant, can I say, often 10 knots or so, until you get one of these. Yeah. And then it's suddenly 40, 50, and there's no one. It's also going to be massively gusty. Correct. That, that as well. But the, the, the thing that I'm looking at here is that, is that it's 
pleasant day, lovely day, winter, da -da 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 -da. let's go out in the tinny and have a few, you know, and, and enjoy ourselves, and then suddenly hit by a massive wind. So it's not only gusty in that 10, 20 thing, which it often is, because it's bumping over the land. You can imagine wind bumping over the land is going to be gusty, because it's going to stop, start, stop, 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 stop. But this pressurised thing, which is what you're actually looking at here, where the wind is built up over there, you can see it's in the wrong direction, it's over there. But it's built up against the mountains. We're talking about Oregon, Japan, New Zealand, both Blackheath, Wilton, um, that sort of area, the Janolan Caves. Pressure up there, and then it's over top the mountains, and it's going, yep, we're heading, we're heading east. That's where we're going. So, um, so for me, this is a this is a real big. Um, as soon as I'm seeing cloud formations, which I'm just about to get to, uh, I, my ears prick up, and I'm going. Where do I go to look at what's happening? I go to Seabreeze to look at, at readings around the place, and I go to um, uh, the, the bomb radar, and then the bomb dot login. And then sometimes it's it's, uh, it's scary how accurate it is. Where you you look, I was running a race up a bit uh, some years ago, and uh, we've been we've got three races away, three short races away, and we wanted. And I said, oh, you want another one? And I went, yeah, yeah, yeah. I think it was lasers or something at the time. Play the spirals, something around it. We're single handed, single handed uh, mode of that, of that sort. And, um, and they went, yeah, 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 let's run another one. And by the time the last boat had finished, I was just assessing what was going on. And I looked up the wind and I saw this colour over, over here. And I said, we are heading for sure. We launched off Sandy Point, which was, we were in that area, so we're quite close. We're only five minutes sail away. And I said, get onto the shore, do it right now, get sails on the boats. Just don't even ask questions, just get on shore and take the sails down. And they did, and then it was just like 40 knots, just flat. Oh. And, and people went, how the heck? You know, and it was this thing that said, it was Doppler that I was able to walk out and see what was going on. <laughs> All right, so. Um, Actually, interesting thing, because if you're, if you're sailing up and down the coast, westerlies are really cool, like seriously, because because there's flat water, like there's no waves or anything, and okay, they're a bit gusty, but you can go up the coast nicely with cruising. A word of warning on westerlies here, and it's this sort of stuff, is that when I'm a middle east sailing the caravan, I'm like that. So so cats have a I mean, I love cats, but they do have a bit of an issue in that if a gust hits a mono, it leans over. Um, whereas if a gust hits a cat, it doesn't lean over very well. Um, so they tend to bury their bowels. If, the, if that's the issue, then they bury their bowels. And of course, then you turn into a pitch pole. They still float, by the way, so that's okay. But pitch pole is not so much fun. I haven't done that yet. Uh, so so what, I find, what I do personally, is if I'm going north and I'm near the coast and, and south and westerly, I won't put the sails hard on. So I won't go upwind, you know, and, and even if I'm tempted to, it's like give the boat some breathing space, give the sails some breathing space. So I'm on a reachy type thing, I'm not sheeted on for maximum speed, I'm giving the boat a bit of room to move and I'm particularly heightened on that going past headlands or, or past spaces where you're expecting those bullet gusts to come through. Because uh, too often if you, if you sheet on and go into race mode, I want to get there fast, but this is how I do it, uh, then you get one of these things, gusts, hard gusts or hard puffs or bullets or whatever you want to call them, um, that's when trouble starts. And um, so, so that's just one of the techniques that I use is just go easy on the, on the sheeting. <coughs> Having a look at cloud arts, um, I'm not a cloud guru, not, not by any stretch. But there's a couple of interesting things about clouds that just basic stuff that works is that nice little fluffy clouds, they, the way clouds work is that they turn up because as the air cools down, they can't hold so much moisture. So the moisture turns into, out of the hidden gaseous thing into little droplets type stuff. That's what we're looking at, that's cloud. Um, so what's happening here is that the air is going up and can't hold as much 
much water in the in the air, and so it turns into this um, into this cloudy type stuff. And so the air around here, down at the water level, is generally going up. It's a little fluffy things of is, is air being drawn up into the cloud. Uh, if you're racing, you can use that to one effect or another, and it might or might not have some success depending on how far away the cloud is and how good you are at it. I've never been good at that one, so don't ask me that one. Um, but that's the, that's the fluffy things, um, they're okay. When you get this one, either this one or this one, but we'll start with this one, still up high, but what happens is that it, it's building up there, goes up, makes cloud, that's good, but then it can't hold it and it's more than cloud, it's actually now rain, so the moisture is, is come together from cloud form into rainfall, and the rain's coming down, that's, the, just the fact of rain falling down is dragging the air down and it splats out at the bottom. That's your squall type stuff. So, so when you see rain and you see even a location, you're likely to get that splat of water of air out the bottom and it comes out in any direction. So it well, generally goes out like that. But if you've got a normal northerly or an easterly or south-easterly or whatever the trade wind is at the time, and then you get a cloud that's dumping with rain, don't expect it'll be in the direction that it was five minutes ago. It could be in 180 degrees the, the other way, depending on where you are in relationship to the cloud. So be cautious of, the, of that um, of that splat exercise. And, and, I, and I'm thinking like anchoring, having space around you, swing room, um, you know, battening down hatches, all that sort of stuff. Question, no, we good? <laughs> um, yeah, so, so just being aware of that and, and what it might provide. Um, then we get into this guy. <coughs> if I can call it a guy, I don't know if you can shoot it. That's, uh, if that's a thing. Um, but it's nice and high. It's got an anvil top on it. Sometimes, eventually it gets an anvil top on it. If you see this, yeah, that's really, that's really squally top stuff. You're, you're looking at heavy rain, this is where I get, you get your black rain underneath these ones. So you get your black rain and you get your very heavy squall coming out underneath. If you can see green in the cloud, you're likely looking at hail. So, so hail. So, so the green goes, the cloud has a tinge of green. Uh, doesn't always, but if you see green, there's a good chance there's hail coming out of it. Um, so that's your extra level of caution and of course with that hail there's more volume of air being pulled down and sucked out the bottom so expect the squall to be harder as well. The, the good thing about these things is that they don't last very long typically so they're over in 10, 15, 20 minutes or so because the clouds moved on. So again you can look at your, go back to your bomb radar and look for your black rain but um, look at where it's going, what direction is it going, how fast is it moving, um, and that, um, that side of things. Um, while we're there on clouds, the thing that, that wind me up are uh, temperature changes. So temperature changes or wind direction changes. So I'm, I'm currently, I'm always just feeling what's going on. So I try and get outside and I go, oh, it's gone cool, or it's gone warm, or it's gone still, or it's gone something. And then it's like, ears pricked up, what's happening with the clouds around me? And if there's internet access, can I go somewhere to actually look at what's, uh, at what's happening? Which leads me to this. So um, when we're looking at, at actually sailing, particularly sailing, but even when we're cruising and we're anchored. Uh, for me, you've got to get outside. You can't do everything from inside because it, it just feels like a little cocoon, and particularly in catamarans, because they're nice and steady, and they're, you know, you, I, I, on, on mine I had stacks of books just um, stacked up flat, probably about this high, a few bottles and other things lying around the place. I only came for 10 years, so I've down the East Coast half a dozen times. Never fell like off, never did anything. 20 knots, 30 knots, no problem. Like, no great dramas. Like, it's something that monos don't understand is that you don't pack anything away because nothing ever falls over. Um, and, and, you know, going downwind, I, autopilot, no problem, you know, just running downwind with 
25, 30 knots up the tail and hey, everything's cool. Like we're doing 10 or 15 knots and you go downstairs and you're just making coffee and drinking a glass and there's a glass on the table just like that, you know? Like it, it's, it's, it's sort of like that. But that is the problem, is that if you stay inside, you don't know what's happening outside. So you've got to get outside and have a look around and get a feel for what's, what's actually happening. And I'm, I'm very keen on not just looking at instruments, but actually putting your face out there into the, into the wind and into the waves and, and seeing what's going on. Uh, when I'm, if I'm sailing by myself, which I, I did a lot of miles on the, on the cat by myself, um, I set multiple alarms um, leapfrogging each other. So I'll set one alarm at 15 minutes and one at 30 minutes. So if I slept through one, I'd pick up on the next one. And if I'm doing a, a longer trip, so like an overnight trip, or anything longer than 10 or 12 hours, I'll, I'll set those alarms all the time and I'll try and get little cat naps. So I'll get little 10 minute cat naps um, and then I'll poke my head up or do a walk around, check radar, check AIS, check what the weather's doing, may or may not do a walk around the boat, probably not every 10 minutes, but every hour or so I'll do a walk around the boat. Um, and then I'll go back to sleep again. And if you get into that routine early, before you get tired, then you can actually keep up and keep, keep it rolling. Um, much better if you've got three or four hands on board and then you can do a proper rotating shift and you can get some decent sleep. But, um, but it was just the way that I, I operated was um, keep, keep topped up, don't wait till you get tired. And, and it annoyed me on any on any um, delivery or you know any anything that's longer than ten or twelve hours. Set the shifts early, and then go. Okay, you're off. Go to bed. But if we need you, we'll, we'll call you back. But but you're on rest time, so go and rest, um, and vice versa. So um, I, I I highly respect that rest uh, rest time. Which brings me to this, so uh, estimating wind. Um, there's a few, I, I tend not to be specific with wind. I don't go, oh, it was 22 and a half knots. Um, well, that might be true in that particular moment at that particular spot, but that doesn't, for me, that doesn't mean anything. Um, uh, not to three knots, glassy. That's, these are just my numbers, I'm just playing with it. It's not the moment scale or anything. Um, three to 12 knots, uh, little ripples. This is a video that I put up on my YouTube channel, which is called Tessa, and it just shows these little ripples. They're about this wide. They're about three or four or five in width, much like you can see right there. They're, if you're looking at anything bigger than two millimeters, you're looking at the wrong ones. And, and they form again and again and again. They only last about half a second or, or one second tops. So you just get to look at them and then they disappear. And if you sort of look with your fuzzy eyes, you go, oh, I sort of, now I can see them. Or you, if you can't, then you sort of look around and go, oh, now I can see them over there. Um, but I use them all the time, particularly coaching uh, in, in little boats and power boats and dinghies and stuff, because I can be driving the boat around and these will give me true wind direction. I don't need to feel it on the face. I can be inside a cabin, and I can look out that side, I can look out that side and get two different wind readings at the same time. The, the challenge with them is that because they change so quickly, they are extremely accurate. So you'll actually see them blow around your boat. They will form the wind around your boat. So you've got to walk a few metres away from your boat to actually see them. Um, but I use them all the time. Um, and in that three to 12 type bracket, and then you start getting white horses, the occasional white horse, okay, about 12 knots. Lots of white horses, we're up into the high teens, uh, early 20s. And, um, and then once the, the spray is getting picked off the top of the wave and the white horse is just, just starting to get a spray off the top, then you're up into that low 30s type, uh, type stuff. And then you get into wind streaks and that's when you've definitely decided that this is not the place where you want to be today. Um, so, um, so roll on with that. Um, who's had a plane in those sort of winds, by the way? <laughs> Couple of hands, awesome. <laughs> Was it enjoyable? No. Yes. No. It was what, what was interesting? Yeah, yeah, that's the word. What, what was the what was the uh, exciting? Exciting. Well, it may or may not be exciting. What, what was the uh, what was the thought? Were you racing or cruising? Racing. 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 Cruising. Cruising. Cruising in the middle of the night. Cruising in the middle of the night. Oh, sweet. Yeah, that, that's get, getting even better. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. Right. And, and what and what was the what was the the things that you did to try and resolve them? 
any any things that we did to try and resolve things? Grief. Grief. Yeah. yeah. Well, yeah, yeah. We, on a trip to Hobart, we we got up to fifty-five knots. Yeah. I was four decky. We tried to put up the storm drift, storm sails. Yeah. yeah. And it wouldn't go up the track because you go halfway up, it pulled out. Right. So Hanks are very good in that situation. Yeah, yeah. But I also had to tie myself on around the cleat, hold myself onto the deck. So as the boat was going oh, yeah. and yeah. down, yeah. Yeah. I, I could maintain. Yeah, it's down the deck. Absolutely. That's actually a really good one. Um, I, I experienced that as a teenager because uh, I was four deck on the. On the Offshore on the hill, and um, I skidded the kite ready. We were just about to go around the top mark, and I, and I got round on the front of the four state. It wasn't 40 knots, it was, it was something much more normal, like 25 or so. Um, I got round into the into the little four peak area right in front of the four state, and, um, and I'm sitting there, and I've got, got my arms around the, around the pulpit, you know, and I'm thinking, yeah, pretty safe here. And I look down and I go, okay. There's no water. I can't see any water. <laughs> I remember launching off the off this bay, and I'm like, "Ah, oh, this is bad. Let's just freaking hold on." <laughs> and then I come onto the onto the anchor roller. Um, but as a teenager, I sort of jumped up and off we went again. There's only one thing worse than that: when you're under the bike and looking up. <laughs> <laughs> That's true. That's very true. Yes, very true. So um, I think look, there are things that we can do, but but it's those. Um, and, and again, oh, that's something actually with the estimating the wind that I didn't have written down there. Always look upwind. So it's very tempting to look out at wind and or water sifting and, and go, oh, it's doing that. If you're looking downwind, the, the waves breaking away from you. So you always read it low if you're looking downwind. Try to look upwind if you can, because then you can see the waves breaking towards you. Um, is my go-to tip of trying to assess what the um, what the wind is and what's going on. Um, I did have a, that piece of that uh, southerly thing that I was talking about earlier on, um, when it hit the, hit the, went off the coast and then came back in again. We had this sort of scenario up at uh, Pickwater and it was interesting how different people reacted with it. So um, I, was, I was in a support boat and um, coaching and running around and the, the start boat was in the middle of the sequence. Uh, it was multi start We had about seven fleets that were running the, on that particular occasion. Start boat was in sequence, and there was a 29er there. And we were only looking half a kilometre upwind or to the south of us, and it just went white. Like, just, just went white. And this is inside Newport, next to the Newport pub. Um, and I'm going, if it's white up there, we're in for a whole heap of trouble. And the, the 29er was sat past the start boat and said, um, what are you going to do about that wind up there? He went, we're in sequence. Number 29, to his credit, went, you can stay in sequence. He was the day with the next stuff. We're just going to capsize and sit on the bottom. <laughs> Which is what they did. Um, I jumped onto the radio, and for all the rest of the fleet, they were actually up to the north, directly to the north of Scotland Island. It was a westerly that we were in at that time. Uh, directly to the north of Scotland Island, and I radioed to a support boat and I said, Under no circumstances is any boat to leave that area. Okay, like, just cut them off, run them down, I don't care what you do, but do not let them leave that area. And so I had a couple of support boats, and I was on the radio going, That boat could just put that blue kite up, get over there, and just shut them down. And, and anyway, they did. The wind came through, and all heck. Like there were yachts going past with flocking sails and they were stripped off and like there was bits of flapping rag going everywhere and things were cartwheeling down the bay and, 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 and we were all over tucking to the leeward side of Scotland Island watching this carnage go past. Meanwhile, the parents were over at Avalon Sound Club looking at the carnage from the other side going, my kids out there. And, and there was all sorts of phone calls and other stuff. And I'm going, it's okay. Okay, we, we're fine. Like, give us ten minutes to sort ourselves out. And kids were just having an absolute ball um, on the upside down boats. Anyway, I'm distracted. Um, I want to just talk about this for a moment. So, uh, for anyone that's been around sailing for a while, knows that here on the east coast we've got a nor'easter. That's a sea breeze. 
and it works with the land getting up, the warm air rise, it forms little clouds, and it comes over here, and the sea breeze is formed by the, by the, the air that fills up this hole because the warm air rises, the cool air goes and fills up the hole, and it goes round and round and round and round. Um, that's a fairly well known um, phenomenon and, and process. The thing that I wanted to talk about here, though, is just be aware that this distance here can be as small as 100 metres. So it can be really, really tiny, uh, particularly when it's the nor'easter starting off at the beginning of the day. You can get just on the water-land interface, you can actually get really nice little breezes happening. And it's, and it's awesome when you're racing and you're, and if you can pick up on that and just start past the entire fleet because they're calm in the middle of the bay and you're just going along the shoreline. Um, that's great. And, it, and of course in the evening it reverses around and I've done the same thing on a twilight. Um, and I've gone, normally you would be in the bay. Who, I mean, no idiot would go over to a steep shoreline to get wind. But as the sun was setting, that was where the cold air was just screaming down the, down the side of a hill. Mm. We just sailed over the hill and we just followed the shoreline 50 metres away, mind you, mm. all the way past the, sailed past the whole fleet and joined in and, and did yeah. the whole finish thing down the other end. And they went, what did you, where, where, what, what? Anyway, so this <laughs> is what's going on. So, so it could be really small, but it could also be quite big. So we can get up to 20, 25 kilometres each way. So a, like a 50 kilometre type range of, of stuff. So if you're cruising and you're expecting the nor'easter, if you're getting out into the 30, 40 kilometre type space, we probably out past it. Um, so be thinking about where do I need to be to be in it as a, as a process to make use of the sea breeze. But of course, this doesn't only happen when the land picks up and the ocean is cooler. It also happens because we've got the EAC, the East Australian Current, is a warm current that runs down the coast, and you actually get this exact same thing happening on that warm, cold current interface. Which is why, if you look particularly at winter, but, but a fair, quite a lot of the year, you can actually see it, you look out off the coast, one or two kilometres off the coast, there's a line of clouds with rain in them that just stay there all day. And that's what this is happening at the on the on the EAC interface of cold water and hot water. Um, and I did it deliberately um, uh, a year or so back from Ellie Bench back to Sydney, and we were sailing through Wood Sundays and just starting to sort ourselves out as to where we were going and what was going on. It was a 60 footer, and um, and they said, oh, so where are we going? Are we going to try and get this current? And I went, yep. Head for that rain over there. And the, and the rest of the crew went, you're kidding. I didn't come on this delivery to get in the rain for five days, six days, seven days. You're nuts, you know? So I went, no, 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 trust me on this. I don't want to be in the rain either, um, but that's where we're going. So we went over to, and I said, don't go into the rain. Just get on the edge of the rain. That's where we need to be, just on the edge of it. Four knots of current. So we were boat the day and four knots free. So we were doing 12 knots down the coast and we carried it all the way right down virtually until we turned left in Sydney Harbour. It was the most awesome, fast delivery that I've done. Before um, you move just by looking at it. Back that so, explains east to west airflow. Where does the northerly component come from? Um, as in nor'easter? Yeah. You're talking about? Yeah. So that's our, um, the, uh, what's it called? Um, because the Earth's turning. Coriolis. Coriolis effect. So at, because the Earth is turning, it twists the, it twists it. I need to get the whole pipe for them and actually do a little bit more on that. But that's what, that's why, and it actually changes. So east, east west across the coast, and then as it strengthens, it actually twists. So, so it will change its direction during the day. And then at night it actually flicks over and does the opposite, the other way. So yeah. As you face it, turns to the left in some ways. And in Perth it's a southwester, right? South, 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 north, north, east, south, east, south, west, east, west, west, west. There you go. Turns left. Southern hemisphere. On the right side. As you face it. As you face it. All the hemisphere is the opposite. Yeah, 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 yeah. That's why the water goes down the black hole in the opposite direction. It's the same. It's the same. Thing. It's actually the same thing. Um, what's going on now? We had another question. No, it's just saying that the southwest in, in Perth. Yeah, so that's yeah, the right. same. Yeah. Yeah, 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 yeah. Cool. Um, 
Anyway, so that's what the uh, that segue thing is, and, and um, yeah, the DAC, which is a really, um, really useful thing. Okay, so just, just quickly, is there a uh, software that has your GPS location that puts it on the current? You know, if you've got current maps on windy and stuff, does the premium do that? Like where you get your GPS, so you know where you are in relation to where the current is? But I don't know the answer to that. It may be smart enough to do that in the app. There's no reason not to in the app. You won't do it on the website, but that might be a good reason to use the app because the app can pull your location off the phone and then say here you are. Yeah, it doesn't do it on the app there. So. Bummer. Okay. Yeah, but right, it, in, right in, there's a feature. Out, you know, and so you pay, pay them $100 a month premium if they put that feature in. that idea that you get the bridge. <laughs> Correct, <laughs> they should. You can use the water to it was, but the, but the app would give, if it was an app and you were using it as an app, it would give you a GPS location. So it would actually put your, like a, like a driving map that says you are here, which would be really cool, actually. I think they should do that. Yeah, so you know, if you go, you know, 50 miles, they should be in the middle of the car. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. No, Otherwise, you, you can work it out so manually, but it's very important. It'd, it'd be much easier on that to just say, here's my boat. Yeah, no, it's. That's very cool. Okay, so this is a little promo from me. Um, this is something I've been working on way too long. Um, and um, it's a simulator thing that I, that I developed um, as part of coaching um, young people to learn to sail and then build racing skills. And, um, and so, so it starts out as a laser. It's got your telltales. Um, I was keen that the graphics I wasn't keen that the graphics are bad, but yes, they are. Um, but I was keen that the physics were accurate. So, so my my focus was on the, the physics side of things. All the physics formulas I've written myself. Um, and that, as an example, you've got body weight position both sideways and fore and aft, which will change your speed and, and how the boat works. Um, you've got telltales. You've got a ledge ribbon, which is reflective of the twist of the sail and. If the, if the sail hooks, so if you have the wind going around on the back of the sail, your leech ribbon will um, indicate that. Um, obviously, your apparent wind is happening down here, and your true wind is another little honey circles type stuff. Uh, there's no go zones that come up, and there's a yacht, and there's power boats, and that other stuff. I'm just about to release a new version, which is a step up on the time trials, which I'm really um, pleased about because it will mean that you can compare your skills directly with other people and and as a as a time trial type thing and go well I got this I took this long to get through that course and they'll do exactly the same course and see how far they go. Um, but if you're and it's available as a free it's a free download. I gave up trying to um, sell it. Uh, so it's now a free download and but yeah, take take its uh, sponsors or helpers. Um, but it's available on the Apple and the Android platform and I'm trying to build a um, YouTube thing, but I must have been renovating the house and the YouTube thing is just a bit slow at the moment. Um, so why do we care with all this weather stuff? The really easy one is, is uh, you know, your tides and the height of the water over above. That, that's a really good starting point for because it's easy and it's not too complicated, there's not too many variables and you can go on all the different models and they'll probably tell you something very similar within a centimetre or two. So that's a really good one to start with. And then you go to um, boat speed. So how fast am I going to get there in these conditions or those conditions with these sails? I, I'm, the yachts, the racing yachts are very fond of polars. I grew up in a dinghy world. We don't generally don't use polars so much. Um, it's a case of look out the window and feel in your seat and in pants and then, and then you drive the boat to the best you can and try and beat the person next to it. Um, so, uh, but, but boat speed does make a difference with your, with your weather forecast and fuel usage. So how much fuel are you going to use going either because you've got sails up or because you're motoring into the wind or whatever and, and putting that into your equations. Anchoring space and food and water and, and it's, um, it's, it's actually quite important. So this actually, this here is a little called mob called Broad's Bay. Just here is um, Busted Head and um, Creek there. Thank you. Creek, thank you very much. Thank you, Creek. Um, Glanson is just here to the, um, slightly to the west of us there. And I was, um, I was heading southbound, coming back from the Whitsundays, 
Um, and I was heading to Pan Pan Creek as a, as a sort of a target, just by myself, and just like, you know, see what's going on. Anyway, suddenly get me, and I'd, um, I'd not misjudged it, I knew it was coming, but it was, I, I thought I could nearly get there. Um, and I went, oh, you know what, I'm just gonna, I'm just gonna head in here, uh, and put the anchor down, and, and they will all be fine. And I spent a week there, and, it, and because I had enough food and water, it wasn't a problem. Like it was just I had internet that was coming from Gladstone, so it's like I just sat down, turned the computer on, away we go. Doesn't really matter where we are, um, provided we've got food and water and it's an anchor down. And um, it actually turned into a really nice spot. There's nothing there, by the way. It's not spectacular in any way, but it did give me protection and there were no other boats to run into. We also had no friends to talk to, but that's another story. Um, unlike uh, unlike Pan Pan Creek. So, so have a look at the tide. Um, and then finally for me, I, I used to play in six knots, so I'd sort of go anywhere at six knots, and if, and if I went faster than that, that was a bonus. And I'd get there a bit sooner. I did get caught one time. Um, I was coming out of Noosa, so I'd gone in a Noosa River for a week um, for a, my partner's friend's wedding or something or other, which was at Tawantum. And so we went in Noosa, so I bought the boat in Noosa, so I'd been in uh, Noosa before. And I, and I went in, um, we had the bottom on the way in, which was great. Uh, but Marine Rescue were there, and they're fantastic. Oh, by the way, if you're ever going into Noosa, I don't know, boat size that you're playing with, there's a draft issue around going in and out of Noosa. Um, but do use Marine Rescue, they're fantastic service. And even to the extent that you can go online onto the Marine Rescue website on Fridays, and they send out a drone on Friday to photograph where the bar is for the weekend, for the fishes on the weekend. So they've gone to that level of service where you go, oh, the, so the track is over there, and then you turn left there, and you go over here, da, 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 da. Anyway, so they met me offshore. I stayed offshore for um, a couple of days on the way in and waited for the conditions to be right, and they came out and met me, and, uh, and we came in and set up a ground and ground. It's not it wasn't scary, but it was certainly a little bit intimidating. We're only, we were closer than from here to the doors away from uh, a big rocky wall um, uh, that's, uh, that's along there. And, uh, and that was in a deep spot, and then we hit the bottom, and then we swung around, and the nose is like, you almost throw a fender out to the rocks, but that didn't work. Um, anyway, they pulled us off, and it was all good. But we went and did the wedding, that's fine. Two weeks later, we'll leave. Tide height exactly the same. And I'm like, oh, it's not looking good. Uh, but anyway, if I didn't get that tide at that particular time, so I was I was leaving on that tide at max tide, just a little bit before, because that's what you sort of do with marine rescue, because I was expecting to go to the, get grounded, but it didn't as it turned out. So I was on that day, on that tide, if I missed that tide, it was two months before I got to that tide again. So it's like, I'm a bit keen to get out on that particular tide height. Mm -hmm. So we did, and we headed south. We were going down to uh, Morton Island and uh, Destination Yellow Patch, and, and off we went. And it was fantastic, can I say? It was just one of those beautiful champagne nor'easters, 15 to 20 knots, had all the sails up, we were ripping along at about 10 knots, and it was just great. Unfortunately, there was a southerly coming up from the other direction towards us. And I knew it was coming, but committed into the process. Another hour, and I would have been there, but I didn't make it by an hour. And this thing was quite severe. It was probably up into the mid 30s or maybe 40 so knots. Um, it was pretty ugly. The seas were short. It was windy. Anyway, cats don't do upwind. People try and tell you that they go upwind, they don't. No, just get over it. They don't go upwind. They try and go upwind, but they go sideways. They go downwind really nicely, they just don't go upwind. But anyway, so I had both motors on. I already pulled all the sails down. I was fully prepared, both motors on. And I'm going into this thing. Well, the other thing the cats do is that they bottom out. So they, you know, we call it, um, uh, what do we call it when we're with the bottom slamming. So the, the waves slam on the bottom of the bridge deck. It's not a very pleasant experience, and when you're sitting in a seat and the, and the seat sort of does this on the floor, like as the, as the bottoms slam up, and it's really noisy and it's quite intimidating. But the, but the solution to that is to slow down. So I had an hour to go for six months, and I'm now doing half a knot. 
<laughs> so my one hour has now turned into six hours or more, probably closer to ten. We did get to Yellow Patch at about two o'clock in the morning. It was dumping with rain. All the fishing boats were there. Luckily, some of them had their lights on, so they, that was great because we could see where they were. Because fishing boats don't use IIS, by the way, because mm -hmm. um, they don't want to tell anyone where they're fishing. That's fine, except for when you're sailing past them, which is a pain. Um, but they do have lights on, so that's good. But, but it was one of those things of uh, what I want to raise was fuel usage, which completely changed on that trip for me. Um, commitment wise, I wasn't, I wasn't keen on going into Brisbane. I did not want to turn around and go back to Bolva, you know, howling suddenly. That was just a recipe for disaster. Noosa obviously was shut to me. Turn around and go further north, I didn't really want to do that. So we just put up the, um, my partner stayed downstairs and I was pretty tired by the time we got anchored out in the other patch. Uh, but got through it and the next day sun came out, it was all good. Um, two, three, ten, two, three. Yes, two, three. Three. Yes, yes, yes. Yes, yes. I went into Pancake Creek. Yeah. 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 Yeah.
there's this parallel universe that happens when you get on the boat. I don't know, I'm sure lots of people here have, have seen it, but you hop on a boat and you go cruising and it's just like, it's, a, it's another world to the traffic and the office and the, and the work and the other things. So um, if you get the chance, um, not even if you get the chance, just do it yeah. and enjoy it very much.